this is the panel on international frameworks. Um, and I will um, introduce each panelist or groups of panelists um, before their section. So we're, we're starting um, with Dr. Judith Turney Purdom, who is Professor Emerita of Human Development at the University of Maryland. Um, and she holds a BA in psychology from Stanford and a PhD in human development from the University of Chicago. She was professor at the University of Illinois Chicago and the University of Maryland College Park. And over the last 50 years, she's conducted research using large-scale surveys, both nationally and internationally, to study young people's political attitudes and civic engagement. In her 1999 study for the International Association for the Evaluation of Educational Achievement, 140,000 adolescents in 29 countries were surveyed. And so she's going to talk to us a bit about the international survey today, and I think um, in particular help us think about how this is playing out on the world stage. Um, so I will turn it over. Dr. Thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure to be here. I began my research in the 1960s in Chicago before most of you were born, and I've been reflecting recently on what it means for the kinds of themes we're discussing today. Two messages stand out, young people's emotions and their interpretations of events and their relationships should have a prominent place in our perspectives on education and activism. My activism actually goes back to protesting during the Vietnam War. I don't know how many of you have been watching the series on television. And I, since uh, a song was part of the last uh, presentation, I'm going to sing you a song uh, from that era. Uh, because I had uh, an anti-war slide program and folk music program, which I showed, which got me in some trouble with authorities here and there. But uh, I can't uh, resist the opportunity to give you uh, a verse of a song that uh, will capture that period. What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? What did you learn in school today, dear little boy of mine? I learned that presidents never tell lies. I learned that soldiers seldom die. I learned that everybody's free. And that's what the teacher said to me. That's what I learned in school today. That's what I learned in school. <laughs> Our next message for this afternoon is that the interactional climate of groups, of a great climate has been created today, but the climate of groups in which students do their learning and their activism is tremendously important, is in many cases as important as the content of what is being studied. And a neighborhood in Chicago, where I lived and worked, was the source for a model that if I have time, I'm going to show you at the end. I'm afraid my song took up my time. <laughs> uh, now, uh, there are some new perspectives that we have in this field today. And I want to talk a little bit about something called wicked problems. How many of you have heard the term wicked problems? Yeah, that's about right. Psychologists are not, uh, and people in this field are not as aware of this as in some other areas. There have been plenty of these problems throughout history. And uh, I want to frame what we're talking about today as in part a problem which is a wicked problem. Now, it isn't the evil intent of anybody to create these problems which is why I think it's sort of a strange name. These wicked issues are often very ambiguous. For example, one person's pursuit of a social cause is seen as very different by somebody in another group. And the context in which an issue is manifested makes a big difference. And in fact, if each of us listed the potential solutions to the problem of uh, limited civic activism, one person's solution could very well create a big problem for somebody else. So treating wicked problems as if they're tame problems is likely to cause a problem, Worse, a worsen, even worsen the problem. However, I believe that psychological research has a role to play in understanding these problems in our field, and I want to briefly discuss 
uh, two studies. I, w I really have time for only one of them. But uh, which came, the first one was from my very early days in Chicago, and the second was the mid-career study I did of um, the large-scale study of 29 countries. This field has been called political socialization research. And I believe that it has important implications for the understanding of the behavior of adults who grew up in certain periods. And that's what I'm going to talk about uh, in the most detail this afternoon. Uh, this is the first book, and I don't have time to talk about this. I had to cut this because I'm afraid I'll go way over time. But it has to do actually with why people didn't vote for president in the last election because they couldn't connect with Hillary. And, but that's, that's another story I don't have time for. Uh, but what I do want to present today is from the large 28 country survey, which is that book. And uh, as important to this as any of the findings was that each country who participated had a real opportunity to influence the way the measures were going to be conducted. This was not a US imperialistic study telling people how they ought to be constructing their democracy. And in fact, for a while, it looked like we wouldn't have a study because we couldn't agree. So I said, well, we've had a nice time. We'll all go home and send each other Christmas cards or something. But it didn't turn out that way. It turned out to be a very successful study. This was very soon after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, input was especially important from the post-communist countries. And I will present the uh, attitudinal data today. Uh, there was a knowledge test, but I don't believe that knowledge is where the action is in this field. And giving more and more knowledge tests of civic structures is not going to get us where we want to be. Uh, this was nearly 20 years ago that this study was conducted, in 99. But nothing of this magnitude has been done since then, because the US refused to participate in the next phase of this study wasn't in our, our national priorities at the Department of Education. But I believe that what this tells us about the results is the formative attitudes and formative years of the generation that is now in their mid-30s. How many of you are in your mid-30s? A few, anyway. Uh, this, is the, this is a generation. These are the attitudes of this generation when they were 14. And I think there's a lot to be learned here. I'm just going to orient you to the scales for a minute. At the top of the chart are support for the rights of women, the scale on the support for the rights of ethnic minorities, and for the rights of immigrants. Then there are two scales relating to relatively traditional patriotism and to assessing trust in governmental institutions. Toward the bottom are two measures of students' beliefs in the norms of good citizenship for adult citizens, either conventional activities like voting or social movement activities. When we did a cluster analysis of students to look for patterns, we got the following clusters. And the lengths of the bars show the extent to which the students in a given cluster were on the average above or below the overall mean on these scales. And the key to the colors, if you can see it, is at the bottom, but I'll tell you what they are. Students in what we call the social justice cluster, which was in blue, were high on attitudes supporting women's rights and rights for immigrants and rights for ethnic groups, and interestingly on the fact that schools should be teaching about these rights. It was sobering, however, that the likelihood of participation in conventional political activities such as voting or running for office or in more social movement activities was low. In other words, they had supportive attitudes, but didn't think that it was important to act on these attitudes. In fact, the group that was most likely to believe in the importance of conventional and social movement activity, the Green Group, had a profile of only moderate social justice activities and had high trust in political institutions. The group portrayed in gray is labeled indifferent because of attitudes quite near the mean on many of the scales. Their indifference was especially marked toward social justice and political and social movement activity. They were, however, the highest of the groups 
on the two scales of patriotism. I'm going to consider the last two clusters together, starting with the most extreme profile shown in purple. These young people showed distinct signs of anger and alienation. The group means on political trust were substantially one and a half standard deviations below the mean, while their attitudes toward immigrants' rights and ethnic group rights were almost that far below the mean. They were negative in their attitudes toward the nation as well as toward women's rights. Their likelihood of positive participation in conventional as well as social movement activities was also very low. This group shows clear signs of what we called alienation. Not shown here is that this group was the one that was most likely to want to do the kind of protesting that we saw in the last presentation. They were quite willing, this alienated group, to be taking over buildings, for example, as a protest. And the group pictured in yellow, which we call disaffected, is similar to the purple group, though not quite so extreme. Now to the distribution in five countries of these clusters. Australia, England, Finland, Sweden, and the United States are in fact in their distributions quite similar, with the yellow disaffected group the most numerous in each country, and the seriously alienated purple group slightly less than 10%. But together, these two clusters are just about as numerous as the social justice supporters and the conventionally supported citizens. So we have almost half and half. Remember that this generation of young people is now in their mid-30s. And I hypothesize that these results foreshadow the election last year, the British Brexit vote, and the increasing number of Swedish voters with anti-immigrant attitudes. And they reinforce my point about the importance of emotions, in this case, negative emotions. This is a summary that highlights the vital role of community support to engage those social justice supporters. They have attitudes that are supportive, but they fail to act or become engaged. Many of these are young women, and remember that studies show that they may need different kinds of supportive environments. Further, we can't ignore the disaffected and alienated groups. The one factor in schools that was the most effective in prevent, I won't say preventing alienation, and being, uh, if possible, uh, a, a way of lessening that, is the open discussion and respectful concern for issues in the classroom. This is very much what Diana was talking about, the kind of discussion where you not only learn to present your own point, but to respect the attitudes and the opinions of your classmates. This has gone through as a thread in all of the studies I have done, and we just found 100 articles which have used this data set, the data set that you see, and the following one in 2009, are available for anybody who wants to do an analysis. And we just found 100 articles of people who had published from these data sets. And I'd say that the open classroom climate point is the one thing that goes through, not all 100 of them, obviously, but through a very large majority of them. I'm going to very quickly show you the, what I call the developmental niche model, which I originally have used to describe the environments uh, of adolescence and was recently picked up by a group at the University of Michigan. I thought this up. If you can't see it, it has quite a bit of emphasis there on neighborhoods and communities and support in one's face-to-face -face groups for one's activities and opinions. Uh, and this, although Bronfenbrenner, which some of you know as the model in this area, kind of does that. It's part of one of the microsystems and it gets involved in the mesosystem, but it's not the main focus. And I believe that communities, neighborhoods, and many of the kinds of groups that you all are working with are the way forward in this area. So specifically, what can we do in preparing leaders for activism? 
Pay attention to group interaction, especially the importance of identity development, respecting others and their opinions and identities, and their attitudes. More tests of the number of branches of government or how a bill supposedly becomes a law is not going to be the way forward in this area. But this is going to be hard to convince people of. I think we need to recognize the value of what we call peripheral participation. That is, the individual who may not want to be totally involved and active, but wants to hang back and look, wants to be part of the group and wait until they feel comfortable with the rest of the people, their peers, or with the situation, or with the issue. This comes from Lave and Wenger's theory on communities of practice, and I recommend that theory to you as well. In conclusion, there are challenges, but also opportunities posed by the complex and interconnected problems that we're discussing. And I hope I have prevented, presented some ways to examine them in depth, and I look forward to the international perspectives of the other speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, and um, I would say that we here in Charlottesville became very well acquainted with that alienated group um, this summer, yes, so that's <laughs> particularly relevant to, to some of us today. So our next two speakers, Dr. Um, Rod Watts and Taffy Tivas, I'll introduce them to you. Dr. Watts is Professor Emeritus of Psychology at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. He's the principal consultant of Action Research Associates and an adjunct faculty member at Pacifica Graduate Institute in Santa Barbara, California. He is both a community psychologist and a licensed clinical psychologist. And because his practice of psychology and applied research emphasizes social justice, his approach to interventions reflect an integrative analysis, one that includes larger social forces and quality of community, along with growth at the personal level. Taffy Tivas is a doctoral student, and he gave me permission to shorten his name so that I don't butcher it, and he will tell you how to pr pronounce his whole name correctly. A doctoral student at the University of Colorado Boulder. Inspired by how young people in Africa navigate and challenge different forms of inequalities, Taffy's research and writing focuses on what he terms, and here I quote him, the shifting spaces and modalities in young people's political participation. In his current role as a research assistant for CU Engage's Research Hub, he creates connections between youth in the U.S. who address systematic, uh, systematic inequalities through organizing efforts with youth doing similar work internationally. So please welcome them. Thanks for that generous introduction, and no one ever God. accused me of being, thank you, of being um, soft-spoken. I need to, I was told to move this uh, thing a little bit further away from me. First thing I should probably say is our study was not a comparative study, so I'm not going to be kind of comparing the U.S. with uh, international groups. Uh, but I'm going to talk about some cross-cutting things that we found, uh, along with some things that really make, I think, the different uh, groups uh, distinctive. And also, uh, Taffy, in addition to uh, being a graduate student in uh, Boulder, he was also our local ethnographer uh, for uh, equal education for over a year in the field uh, there in South Africa, and um, so an important contributor to the data I'm about to discuss. Thanks to our... Um, Funders, uh, a few foundations you see at the bottom there, and also my uh, co-investigator, uh, Ben Kirchner, along with Rashida Govan and Jessica Fernandez. So, um, just a couple questions we had in mind when we did this. How does participation in social activism, uh, what I'm going to call collective structural practices, rather than that's, I know that's a mouthful, but rather than community organizing, because one of the points I want to make in this talk is that where the, so the soil where this activism uh, sprouts is going to determine what the strategies, what the worldview, and what the tactics are. And then I'll also ask the question, what organizational practices are associated with social and intellectual growth, academic attitudes, uh, and leadership? So we went in with this. What we didn't go in with is thinking about social and emotional learning. We had some interest in that, but it turned out to be a major 
thing that we, uh, we found in this study, so echoing some of the issues on emotion that, that you mentioned. So here's our studies, uh, four in the U.S., uh, one in San Francisco, Chicago, New Orleans, and um, uh, Denver. Uh, two in Ireland, one Northern Ireland, one in the Republic of, and uh, equal education in South Africa. Um, just a few things. We were looking for folks who had, who call themselves uh, youth adult partnerships. We were looking for those who had been around for a while and seemed to provide a sustainable model for doing uh, this kind of structural work and had some tangible accomplishments. I'm going to go through that kind of fast because I want to move on. Mixed field, we did a lot of field work education for a couple of years. We volumes of ethnographic data in a variety of forms. We also did surveys as well, and um, we had the youth also uh, address some of the research questions we had and give their own take on things. A little bit about um, one thing in doing international work that's important is trying to think about how different how to think about racial ethnicity and sectarian identities. Because in Ireland, the racial scheme uh, or the scheme in which you think about different socially salient groups is quite different. So you see the complications of doing this work, which hints at the importance of history and culture in determining how these, uh, uh, these groups dealt with social issues. So um, I'm going to talk about three different ways that we thought were really important in determining what structural practice looks like uh, at the sites. And really, again, my community psychologist comes out here because there's really an interaction between these three factors and how they think about social change, how they describe what they're doing, and how their tactics look like on the ground. So starting with the cross-cutting things that we found we, in, in all the sites, but manifested quite differently based on the three things I mentioned before, are clinical, uh, critical thinking and analysis, critical consciousness, if you like, for the Freerian folks here, <laughs> community leadership and action, and we're thinking about collective leadership, not a traditional mode of leadership, because we were really impressed how young people across all these sites really helped each other become leaders and relied on each other and supported each other. And this one was something we didn't expect. It came up inductively. Uh, we, got a, we think we found a lot of evidence as young people talk about their experiences and what we saw observed is how they learn to deal with the difficult emotions that you describe with around anger and also how they learn not to manage those, as we often talk about them in, in the curriculum, uh, curricula on social-emotional learning, but to direct them and to channel them into effective work. And anger is not a good, sustainable thing to motivate you for the long run in, in community organizing. It's, it's more of a signal, just like putting your hand on a hot stove, that there's a problem I need to solve. But staying with that burning fee feeling is not going to be a good, a good uh, strategy for long-term work. But they learn to really transform anger into action is one of the things we've said. But let me go on to this um, last slide. The fourth thing that's not one of the three because we're still trying to agree. It's quite contentious, so we need some of this dialogue uh, uh, stuff working for us. It's compromise. But what you see around here are our main outcome variables. And, we're, and one thing we're certain about is the, the culture influences that, but that's a work in progress. Last slide, unique contextual features, historical, cultural, and political, as I man, mentioned. But this is where I like to think about the themes I described below, is that that seems to be consistent among all of them. Now, and there are other unique things that we're not making, but in terms of consistent things, we think these three are important but they really play out quite differently in these settings. So it cuts across, it sort of is filtered through these three, and what you see in terms of what manifests on the ground, how they talk about their work, how they describe it, looks very different. And with that, I'm gonna turn over to Daph, and he's gonna to talk to you about some of these themes in the South African context.
Thank you, Dr. Watts. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, and thank um, Youth Next for having us here. Um, I want to also uh, um, acknowledge in absentia uh, Dr. Ben Keshner, who's my advisor, whose shoes I'm standing in right now. He was actually meant to be the one that was um, going to present this work, but uh, I guess in the interest uh, of promoting young people, I really, <laughs> it is an embodiment of what we are trying, what we're talking about. I came here to talk about the work that we were doing. He is actually the, the co PI on the project. I was just um, a researcher. But um, let me just start by introducing um, Equal Education, which is a, a group of, uh, which is a, basically a movement of learners, parents, teachers, community members working for quality and equality uh, of education in South Africa. Now, basically, just by describing this as this type of group that has multiple stakeholders, that includes youth, community people, teachers, that creates dilemmas of practice that I think have been coming out uh, throughout the day. Like, how do you navigate those kind of spaces, and what kind of uh, uh, skills do do we need to, or as youth, uh, to to adapt in order to still effectively come up with change by navigating these structures that are influenced by history, culture, and the political systems in which uh, youth function in. And one way to describe this, at least for me, it's, it's, it's increasingly becoming uh, imp uh, important, I think, that I describe this work as a, as, as a really youth having an embedded uh, autonomy. Uh, it is a concept that was uh, introduced by a sociologist called Peter Evans, but I, I use it to, to try and, and illustrate how youth can, can exercise agency within the confines of the structures that they are operating in. And this is what uh, Dr. Watts was kind of talking about. I will illustrate a case uh, uh, that kind of speaks to that. Now, South Africa's history is a history of youth involvement in political, uh, uh, in, in the politics of the country. In 1976, the pivotal moment that led to the end of apartheid was actually youth uh, who were fed up of learning Afrikaans coming out and protesting uh, a, a, a against the use of Afrikaans um, as, the, as the lingua franca in the, in, 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 in the school system. But, a couple of years later, in post-apartheid setting, in 2014, a couple of young students uh, at a school called Sismisela were frustrated that they didn't have teachers, but none of the authorities at their school could fix this problem for a month. Now, the students felt that it was a technical school and Essentially, they were going to get assessed over material that they never even got to, to understand. But like the, the class of 1976, these youth were confronted with, the, with, with a structural problem, but they had to rethink the kinds of uh, strategies that they would deploy in order to, to effectively come up with some kind of change at the school. And what they did was they started by, confront, by, by, by negotiating with the teachers and the principals, and when this didn't happen, they had to basically uh, uh, try and mobilize each other and to see the provincial minister of education. But they were confronted with armed police when they got there, uh, when they were trying to, to protest. But what they managed to do was to hold this peaceful protest that led to, to a really huge uh, uh, debate in the, in, in like on social media, people uh, um, tweeting and, 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 and sending stuff out on Facebook talking about how armed police reminiscent of, apart, of, of the apartheid state were being deployed to silence youth who had at the time not been having any teachers and they were having a legitimate form. But what we see in this picture at least is the manner in which there are different strategies. What we had seen there were youth that were 
uh, 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 directly in confrontation with the authorities. But in this picture, as you, as you, as you saw, there was a, at least um, a, a willingness from the, from the young people to start negotiating and navigating these structures differently, acknowledging the different political system that they find themselves within, and acknowledging also that culturally, uh, the has, the, at least within this context, respect for elders is valorized a lot. And in this manner, the outcomes were slightly different. The, um, the youth eventually got the, the teachers that they want. They were addressed in that picture by the provincial, uh, provincial minister as a, as a result of the kind of public outcry that emerged from it. So I guess what this case illustrates is, is, is at least for us, that critical thinking and analysis are pivotal skills that uh, may not be needed just uniquely in, in the context that I'm talking about, but that could be useful uh, across different spaces where youth could really think about the different uh, um, political systems and historical situations that they find themselves in and think about ways that are pliable within the structures that they exist in and effectively come up with, with solutions to address the challenges that they, they have. Uh, what that also illustrates and is linked to is a, is a kind of community leadership that, not is, that is not really a zero-sum game between, we, I, I heard this when we were talking about uh, uh, adults and, 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 and youth. It, it, it could be a positive sum that is not only about youth uh, uh, going against the adults, but really finding ways that could uh, be positively meaningful to all stakeholders involved. And that, require, that it requires kind of social and emotional learning, and, 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 and these are just outcomes as well as, uh, as, as cues that are necessary for this kind of work. Thank you. So, next up, we have Aaron Azelton, who is the National Democratic Institute's Director of Citizen Participation Programs. He's a civic, engage civic engagement specialist who's helped to manage, design, and implement inclusive political participation programs at NDI since 1992. Currently, he supports NDI initiatives by providing guidance on all aspects of community organizing, advocacy, government monitoring, and nonprofit organizational development. And he helped design or NDI's Civic Forum Program, which is a unique approach to promoting civic action in developing societies. We also have Gospar Jaluzzi. I apologize. Get, okay. Um, who is Senior Program Officer at NDI's office in Albania. And he's been engaged with NDI since 2011, covering areas of public advocacy, political party youth assistance, elections, and he served on as parliamentary liaison to NDI regional programs. His contribution to democracy assistance is related mainly to promoting youth political participation, organizing, and mentoring youth groups on advocacy, policy making, and assisting various youth forums in drafting political programs and manifestos and helping to organizational structuring. And finally, we have Zin Moon Du, a program officer at NDI in, um, NDI in Myanmar. She assists the parliamentarians of Myanmar's union parliament. She's worked for charity-oriented charity Myanmar as a training coordinator, organizing leadership and political awareness for next-generation training camps for ethnic youths around the country from 2011 to 2013. She's the founder of an institute which provides leadership and community peace-building skills to young women around the country, and she joined NDI in 2016 to help prepare her to run for office in the future. Uh, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of NDI, I want to thank the Youth Next Court uh, organizers for inviting my colleagues and I. Um, we'll try to finish strong, but it's really, really hard to follow some of the discussions today. But uh, 
we'll do our best to at least try to affirm some of what we've heard um, and, and put it um, within an international context. Um, do this right. Oop. Okay. I think we're missing a slide, but nonetheless, um, we're probably going to go a little outside of the bounds of that title because I want to let my colleagues talk about some aspects of youth participation that we haven't necessarily touched on today, and that's youth participation in political parties and youth running for office and becoming members of parliament um, in the case of Myanmar. Um, but first, let me tell you a little bit about NDI. NDI is an international non-governmental organization. We work globally. We have offices in 60 countries, although we're headquartered in Washington, D.C. Um, and for the last 30 years, we've helped support democratic political transitions around the world. Um, we work with what we describe as small D Democrats that are seeking um, more accountable, transparent, and inclusive um, political processes. And to do that, we work with political parties, parliaments, civil society organizations, election management bodies, and directly with citizens. Um, to help them play their respective political roles and to shape a culturally appropriate democratic system in their country. Um, and I think, as we can all agree, I mean, these are really, really busy times when it comes to democracy. Um, and it's being challenged, I guess, um, in many ways. Uh, particularly internationally um, by what we describe as rising authoritarianism. And it's seeking actively to try to undermine democratic norms and practices, and we see that here, and we see it abroad. And I would note that you know, this, this term erasure is the first time I had heard it, but it actually describes something that goes hand in hand with nationalism and authoritarianism. And we see it you know, in many countries around the world, and my colleagues who um, live in countries that have experienced communist rule or military dictatorship can tell you all about erasing the history of other, um, other groups within the country. This means we all need to work harder and smarter. Um, in, at NDI, we believe one way to help turn back this rising tide is to help youth play a more active civic and political role. In our experience, this means helping young people develop a stake in a democratic future where they have a voice in decisions. And I think we've heard that on several occasions today. Um, the challenge for us, though, is figuring out how to do that in countries that are transitioning from conflict, crisis, and authoritarianism, and also countries that are backsliding, um, that we thought were democracies but are, are moving backwards. So to help figure that out, we undertook a study, and we're not academics, we're not researchers, so it was more of a, you know, kind of an introspective look at our programs. And we organized it or framed it in terms of positive youth development principles, and it was carried out, which I should say emphasizes the role of young people as part of the solution and not part of the problem. The study was carried out by young people interviewing and facilitating focus groups with young people on five continents. Um, and we did that over the course of a year. We finished it about six months ago. Um, you can find the study on our website. Um, the centerpiece of the study is this theory of change, which actually you know, gets at, again, a number of things that have, have come up. And I'm not sure whether we should be you know, kind of proud of that fact or feel stupid for not having sought your advice earlier. Um, you know, the one thing I would say that was, I mean, crystal clear in the discussions with young people on five continents was they equate participation with having a role in decision making, both formal and informal, period. And they complain when you know, things become tokenistic or that there's national youth policies that acknowledge them but then ignore them, or quotas that you know, give them a seat but then they don't have a voice. Um, so you know, taking those things into account, I mean, that's what we're looking at in terms of an end game is where youth can play an active role in decision making. And is, you know, from left to right, that's what we're trying to move towards. The theory talks about two different dimensions, youth agency and an enabling environment. And those are things that we found you have to work on simultaneously. 
And again, it gets at a lot of the things that have come up in today's conversation. You know, at the top end about meeting youth where they are, I mean, it's not a homogeneous um, population. On the bottom, I mean, addressing structural inequities that exist, and this is where we get at intersectionality, for example. Um, you know, developing youth assets, cognitive skills, life skills, analysis, confidence. You know, on the bottom, you know, creating space for their participation, places where they can demonstrate their value. Um, fostering youth-led collective action, really, really important. But I would note that it's not just youth working with youth on youth issues. It's youth working collectively with others on community issues. I mean, it can be both, but it seems much more transformative when youth are working alongside other members of the community. Um, establishing the value of their participation by demonstrating that they have something to add, you know, that they, they bring something to the table. You know, looking for entry points across the political cycle. And that's why I think it's important to hear about young people participating in political parties and running for office and doing other things, um, you know, rather than just working on, on civic activism. And then the intergenerational relationships. So what we found is all of that, you know, combines to begin reducing those barriers, but it's, it's, it's an action-oriented way of doing it. It, it. It's those barriers, particularly in the places where we work, are not going to come down unless, you know, this combination of things is happening. And it's iterative. I mean, it, it takes time. Um, but you can find champions. You know, one of the things that we do at NDI, and I'm, I'll finish here in just a moment, is, you know, we... we in our local offices around the world, we recruit a lot of young people, particularly to help deliver assistance to other young people, and my colleagues are examples of that. And I, the last thing I would like to say is that um, we need to thank, and I needs to thank Google, who provided financial support to bring um, Zinn and, and Gasper um, to this conference, so we're appreciative for that. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to them, and, and, and they can share their experiences. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to be here and to hear lots of this young, to see such a youth leadership here in this room and to see that also that some of the challenges that we're mentioning here, we also share also in an international level of the countries that we come from. So I'm Gaspar, I'm from Albania, and um, it's a pleasure to be here and to share a bit of the context where Albania is now, still uh, considered a young democracy, and where in 1991 actually was a youth movement and protest who overthrew the most of the, one of the most uh, totalitarian regimes that existed in Europe. And since then, Albania has made quite a lot of progress. It's a NATO member and has made progress in its EU path towards EU integration. But still, the, the political corruption and the political polarization has slowed down this progress. So we at NDI, we saw that it's important to work with the youth politically engaged people in order to create a new political culture of cooperation and dialogue based on, based on principles of inclusiveness, accountability, and transparency. So we work with the youth youth in political parties, youth that run for office, young MPs, with youth that are local leaders in their communities. And uh, we talk about issues, about the importance of the youth engagement around the policies. In countries like Albania, where the politics is quite centralized, it's very difficult for the young people to be promoted or for their opinion to be, to be heard or able to influence in the decision making. So that's why, and here we heard a lot today about this uh, ena enable the environment for the young people to, to influence and to, to say their voice. So we, we have seen that where those mechanisms exist in the parties, we have seen that the youth can influence and can say, can, is able to say that voice. 
especially, for example, for issues that matter to them, such as education or the youth unemployment, when we have the youth activists being able to monitor the legislation or advocate for improvement in the legislation. Another issue that, or another approach that we have brought to the table was the cross-party initiatives. So we bring people from different political parties to work together on local issues. This has helped these young people to leave behind their political affiliation and focus a lot on the issues that matter to them and to their communities. So for example, we have local leaders working on issues related to transparency in the local budgets or improving the public transportation for in the community that they live or tackling matters related to corruption. And um, as we know, corruption and the source of corruption sometimes and often is in the political parties. So we believe that talking about corruption and way to, to, to fight corruption with those people who are engaged in political parties or politically is very important in order to create a different culture and a different way to, to fight from also from inside. Hoping to find also, let's say, reform-minded people inside who are able to make their political leaders more accountable. So, some lessons learned. I mean, this is a very long process. It's, it doesn't happen within a day. There, it needs to be an environment there and the setting that these people are able to, young people to, to operate and to influence, but there, are, there needs also a way to equip them with the skills, the skills of uh, doing a proper, as we mentioned during discussion, proper research, a proper issue identification, a proper stakeholder and outreaching stakeholders or communication skills. So this is what we are trying to do. It's uh, lots of energy out there when it comes to the youth and the youth who wants to contribute in politics. And uh, what we have seen is that those parties who have young people that contribute on issues, those parties also take those issues and prioritize on them, such as I mentioned before, education or unemployment. So this energy is important to be channeled also for the good of the young people and also for the good of the community. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for having me uh, to share my experience. Um, uh, I'm from a country uh, which is uh, which struggled very long time for a, a half century under the military, military dictatorship. And uh, during those time, uh, my country was closed off uh, um, from the outside war, and uh, freedom of speech is severely uh, restricted. Um, and, uh, uh, even the word Nanyaye, meaning politics, uh, uh, could lead to one arrest. And um, um, the, the amount of money uh, invested in education was inadequate, and uh, uh, there's uh, all the university dropped uh, uh, any uh, subjects, any political subjects. So uh, people, uh, the young people, they don't know, uh, they don't know politics. They are not there enough to say the word, even the word politics. So politics was a taboo in our country. But uh, into, uh, right after 2008 Nagi Cyclone, uh, which uh, wiped over 200,000 people within hours, uh, international fairness flow into the uh, flow to the national uh, local civil society organizations. And at that time, they, uh, and, and right after two years, uh, after two years uh, that events. Um, a first general election in 20 years, uh, two years, uh, 20 years, uh, uh, 20 years was held in 2010. And at that play, at that time, uh, so we people really hoped that a free and fair election, but uh, that election was uh, uh, not free and fair election, and it just military dictatorship. Uh, they just transformed themselves to uh, a nominally uh, a civilian regime. 
So at that time, uh, the civil society organization were aware of uh, the vital role played by young people in the political transition. So they started uh, uh, investi inv investing the investing their findings in uh, youth empowerment programs. And so I mean, uh, they launching they they started launching uh, sort of a young uh, uh, youth political knowledge uh, program, but uh, with the another with another title like. Uh, Young um, how can I say I, I, um, uh, social entrepreneurship, youth leadership, or something like that. I am the product of such uh, organize such organization, and we don't have any chance to practice our political knowledge, even though we gain it, not the knowledge through that kinds of uh, pro uh, training programs. Uh, um, for me, I'm a young woman, so it's really hard for me to find such kind of uh, the right place as such National Democratic Institute. Before that, I was working for the uh, a couple of local civil society organization, and uh, I'm I'm aware that uh, this is re it is very important to create a space for the young women to be able to engage in the political uh, activities. Uh, I uh, so I'm. Uh, I, care, I launched a kind of a mentorship program. This is a, a co, uh, um, mentoring, uh, mentoring by the uh, women leaders, and uh, they mentor the uh, young people who are in potential in 2014. And in 2000, uh, at the uh, end of the 2014, I founded the, I founded them. Uh, um, then, uh, Goddess Institute, and uh, we are providing the civics education and the uh, peace uh, building uh, capacity to the young people, young women leaders around the country. And uh, finally, um, I found uh, that uh, uh, National Democratic Institute, and I'm closely working with the uh, women or uh, women parliamentarians. Uh, the challenges is uh, women are always uh, questioned, uh, always uh, questioned uh, on their ads, and also they are uh, and and trusted, and they are and res uh, disrespected by the elders. So it is really huge uh, uh, barriers for us to overcome that challenges and that cultural norms and to engage that kinds of uh, um, political engagement. So um, I I'm feel like I'm responsible to uh, create that kinds of spaces for the young people and also young, uh, especially for the young women. And also, I, I I don't think this is not my response. This is not only my responsibility. This is uh, this is uh, our responsibility to sp uh, create that kinds of spaces in our uh, for the our next generation. Thank you. Thank you all. So we do have some time for questions. Um, I'm going to open it up with a question of my own to the group. So it struck me as I listened that we sort of moved from starting at this end of the table with a narrative about young people who are alienated from and disaffected from and not trusting in political systems, right, to sort of thinking about um, youth activism within systems and sometimes pushing against systems to countries in which there were no options for anybody to participate necessarily in democratic systems and, and sort of thinking about engaging youth in new democracies. Um, and that just struck me. And, and I wondered if, I'm thinking of this as starting at the NDI end of the table, but then, then um, having anyone else comment as well. But I'm wondering if, if from the folks at NDI, thinking about the work that you're doing in, with youth in emerging democracies, if there are lessons that you've learned in, in the kinds of work that you do that we may be able to think about in engaging the youth who are showing up in democracies as alienated and disaffected. Um, so um, um, most of our children are taught not to make the mistakes. So they don't have any chance to learn, the mis uh, learn from their mistakes. Uh, so, um, uh, and also, uh, Hierarchy system is very rooted in our country. So whatever you do, uh, you have to always uh, follow your seniors, your elders person. 
So, um, for example, when the women ran the campaigns, uh, ran an office uh, for the 2050 general election, uh, these women, young women, especially young women, they are always questioning, how capable you are? Uh, you know, uh, what's your experience? You don't, if you don't have experience, how do you, uh, how do you work? How do you take, undertake that kind of works? You know, so uh, they have to do that. They they have to prove. They have to prove that they are able. But to be able to prove that they are able, we have to. That there must be an opportunity to show that they they are able to do it. Uh, so uh, this is a kind of. Uh, uh, um, how can I say, um, um, ch challenges for us. And uh, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm always, uh, always, I'm also always doubt my, uh, my capability behind the society. So, uh, but whenever, uh, whatever I achieved, everything I achieved, uh, I thought myself that, oh my God, my ability is beyond my, beyond I think I am, I can. So, and they to be able to, uh, 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 challenge that to be able to overcome that kinds of disrespect and uh, manners from the society and uh, from the elders or something like that. We have to have uh, we d we we must have the uh, space to sh show that we are able. So creating the such, such kind of spaces, such kind, such kind of opportunities for the young people to be able to prove them to make them to prove that they are able is very important. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think there's a real pattern here. The, the slide I told you, I talked about around um, youth organizing culture. We found that a lot of the young people are disconnected, but there's a lot of attention put on creating a place of belonging for young people where they belong, they get support from peers, and there's a lot of attention paid to that. Because to be honest with you, most, unless the young people have parents or other folks close to them who have modeled activism, have really mm -hmm. steeped them in that. Mm -hmm. Those folks will come just because they're interested in those issues, but most young people come, the guys will say, well, because I heard some girls there. Or um, they'll say, well, John, I'm coming here with John because he always says I should come. But it's over, only over time when they really get connected to the political issues and they sort of work with that. So I agree, it's so important. If, and in the, in the um, slide I showed you with our outcome variables around it, what I didn't say is our measure of the uh, culture, organizational culture, was significantly related to all of those variables, all of them. Mm -hmm. Which says to me, if you don't get that right, mm -hmm. it's hard to get anywhere else. Yeah. And so I think that, and you mentioned around alienation, mm -hmm. getting people belonging to something is really essential. Adults as well as young people. Yeah, and also uh, such kind of uh, um, a disrespectful manner by the society make you internalize that I am not able. I I cannot do that. I can you know I I am not. I don't have enough capacity to achieve that goal or something like that. So it make you feel really low self esteem, uh, mm -hmm. low confidence. So I think this is a huge challenge for us to overcome. And, and we have to, I, for me, I'm also stay such kind of challenges. I'm challenging every day. And I also told my, I also tell myself that you are able, don't listen to the society, you know. Mm -hmm. In that way, I have to um, overcome my challenges. Yeah. I'd like to pick up one theme here, which I think we don't discuss enough, which is the gender differences. Mm -hmm. If you looked at those clusters, I didn't present them by gender, but can you guess which group is most likely to be alienated? Male or female? Yeah. Male, yes. Yeah. And the uh, young women are very likely to be found in the social activist, uh, social justice attitudes, but not action. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what's interesting is there are also some gender interactions. If you look at the effects of open mm -hmm. classroom climate, interestingly, a uh, uh, marvelous stu former student, Carolyn Barber, who did a very interesting study of, what, of how males and females react differentially to open classroom climate in terms of their attitudes toward women's rights. And our, our women's rights items in, these, in this study are not very extreme. Mm. I'm, in fact, they kept getting watered down as we went along, but they're, they're still 
you know, women should be paid the same for doing the same work, for example. Maybe that some people think that's radical, but anyway, uh, women should run for political office. And the gender differences are just enormous in this. Uh, everywhere, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, Latin America, you name it. But an open classroom climate has some effect on, appears to, on male attitudes. In other words, an open classroom climate where presumably girls as well as boys are expressing their opinion appears to be associated with higher support for women's rights among the group that is less likely to have this support to begin with. And also recently, uh, again, I'm, I'm getting much more interested in these days in what we used to call interactions than in main effects. I'm not as interested in gender differences as I am in and how different experiences are different for males and females. Some evidence that having, uh, there is a, a tendency to uh, make smaller the difference between the expected conventional participation of males and females. In other words, boys are much more likely to think they're going to run for political office and be active in presenting their uh, political opinions. Uh, but uh, experiences like student government and volunteer experiences seem to reduce that gap a little. Not a lot, but enough to say it's really important that we continue to press for young women to have the kinds of opportunities. And I was most interested in the presentation that was made about the effectiveness of, and the interest of young women in some of this participation. Questions, thoughts, or comments from the rest of you? Yes, right there. So I was more interested uh, in Dr. Judith's study that she conducted back then, uh, <laughs> but more so like with the gender differences in activism. I was just Could you speak a little louder or a little? Uh, I'm not hearing you. Oh, um, so I was just more interested in your studies that you did. Uh, in the 60s, and I was just looking into like the, I'm more interested in the gender differences, like why does that occur? And why is it so spread out across the globe where, or is it, has it changed throughout time with young people? Or is it still the same as back then where things were more conservative? So have you seen a difference or has it just stayed the same across time? Well, because the measures weren't identical, I can't say precisely whether the size of that has changed or not. But the, I, the IEA civic education study I was citing from the different countries was conducted in 99, again in 2009. And if you keep your eye on the newspaper, you're going to get the reports in about a week of the running of the study in 2016. Of course, the U.S. didn't participate in the last two studies because it wasn't science and mathematics. Uh, <laughs> where we do want to know where we stand internationally, we're not as interested in, in other areas. But the gender differences, at least in that time period, are, are pretty s similar across. I mean, maybe they're getting slightly less. I haven't looked at, at, at the most recent one, uh, but they certainly haven't changed in such a way that they're really uh, so uh, equal now in political aims or in uh, a variety of, of aspects. But I think what probably is also the same is that, cert that certain kinds of experiences in which young women can have, uh, have a community of practice, going back to Laven Winger's notion, uh, where they can feel that part of their identity is a political identity and where they have other people to participate with and where they have an opportunity to have what's called peripheral participation. That is, not having to go right out and make a speech and, you know, first week you're in the group, you've got to be out there doing all this, but to hang back a little and watch and then to be encouraged to move more from the periphery into the more central parts of an organization. Now, very often what happens, I'm afraid, is uh, that among adolescents in those kinds of groups, the boys take over from the beginning, and there's not as much opportunity for the, uh, the girls to kind of have this space to, uh, to get themselves feeling uh, 
competent and willing to put, put themselves out as a political actor. I, I was just going to also really quickly um, follow up on that. I think we also think, can think about how different people see themselves represented, right? Yes. But then also how people who look like them um, are responded to and treated, right, mm -hmm. in the public sphere, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's also the, the, the it, there, it's not just having those role models, but also think, seeing what's happening to the role models, right? And wondering whether you want to be yeah. treated like those role models. Um, That's very insightful. Right? So yeah. I, th I think there are other things that... that, that, that yeah. um, I saw a couple of other hands. I think there was... Did you? Yeah. Um, a non-youth <laughs> can do... Um, and I, I certainly understand the, the, the role we play in, in creating and enabling environments. Uh, but I, I, when Taffy, when you were speaking, I, I wondered, uh, if I understood you correctly, you said it's, use, it's use, useful for youth to understand the, the social s structure they're in and what, and what strategies might work in that uh, culture, and I'm wondering how would youth gain this information? Um, right. I, it, it almost like I mean, if if it's up to me, then I become the the teacher and the um, and and again, it's 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 not suggesting that youth can do. So I'm I'm wondering how that dialectic works. Uh, thank you. So the. So the way that I tried to represent um, youth was to talk about youth as embedded within a society and a community, but while sim simultaneously true to what you just invoked, the dialect, right, having autonomy within that. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, there's a narrative that often gets played when adults talk about what they can do to create these spaces. Actually, youth are creating these spaces. It's not, uh, it's not just the sole responsibility of adults. I think what, needs, what, what we need to acknowledge are the kinds of things that youth are agitating for and, and how within the confines of those structures, adults can be able to support those initiatives if they are in, to the benefit of the commons. Um, I think I think that's 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 the part that that it's it's really a concerted effort that sometimes requires uh, uh, youth to take lead and sometimes youth to learn from 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 adults. This is why I talk about it as a positive sum rather than a, a, a zero sum game. There are moments where mm -hmm. youth have to 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 acknowledge. Uh, uh, lessons and, and, and from, from adults, as well as moments where adults have to acknowledge lessons from, from the youth. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, back here and then up here. Yeah. Uh, yes, this has been very, very interesting. And I'm not sure, Nancy, if you asked the question that I was thinking about asking, so I'll just go ahead and ask mine. Um, in terms of gender differences, uh, and especially where there are those countries that had experience with a, a woman national leader uh, in the form of president, prime minister, uh, and the like, uh, do you think that has any influence on what, will, uh, what women will do, and particularly what young girls will do in those kinds of, of societies? I'm not sure, it seems like all of you were sort of dancing around my question, so but uh, would you just speculate, or if your data doesn't su uh, suggest it? Um, Unfortunately, on? there were too few examples of that, uh, at least at the time we did the study I'm talking about. Iceland is one where that yeah, well, was they didn't historically participate, the case. Unfortunately, oh, okay. <laughs> Israel. There are other parts Myanmar. of the world, though, where, yeah. where so a lot of the women are. Yep. Pakistan. Pakistan, um, yeah. Right. Pakistan. Had, um, yeah. So it's interesting. Yes, Myanmar also have the national leader is the women, yeah. but even her is discriminated by the constitution. You know, in our constitution, it says that 
Uh, it prohibits anyone with a foreign spouse or child from becoming president. So, and also the another provision is uh, the, uh, the job which is suitable for only men cannot, uh, how can I say, no, anyone, uh, no one can uh, break that uh, opportunities for that man or something like that. So such kind of provisions, uh, constitutional provisions, discriminate the women mm. legally, you know, so. And also, uh, and also another uh, aspect is uh, our country's, uh, sorry, our constitution is translated into uh, uh, English. Mm -hmm. In that, Engli mm -hmm. uh, in that uh, English uh, translation, they only use the candidates for, the pronoun for candidate is only him <laughs> or his yes. or he or. So mm -hmm. the way they think is, uh, the way they think uh, is like the politics is not the women works. And also uh, for me, I mean, I'm, in 2011, I told my father that uh, I will serve as a candidate, uh, I will serve as a parliamentarian. And after I learned 2008 constitution, and at that time my father told me, are you crazy, daughter? Because, yes, because at that time they thought, they thought that the democracy is a sort of uh, not real democracies, you know, so uh, they cannot, we, we couldn't dream even democratization, so, you know, so my father told me, but he supported me a lot. He buy, after that, he bought me a, a book about uh, Gondoliza Rice and also uh, India Gandhi, so it makes me to dream, to, to follow my dreams. Um, so one of, one of the things we talked about, you talk about um, young people learning these things from adults and, and thinking critically about the kinds of strategies that they apply um, to address social justice goals and also how they establish the cultures of organizations. But also, you know, I think, I mean, my research is in the United States and um, one of the things that's very strong in the U.S. is inter is inter youth organizational networks, right? So, like, there's all kinds of there's you know a massive network of youth organizing groups in in the United States, and they're connected. You know, they're constantly connected. They're constantly learning from one another, and um, and they so within organizations, young people are passing down knowledge and um, and passing it across generations of youth, and also across geographic areas and across organizations, people are are doing that as well. And um, I know the the youth organizing group that I've studied it has done it internationally uh, in South Africa and in several other places. But um, I'm curious when when you are all thinking about, um, especially I guess. Um, the, the multi-site site study and the NDI uh, groups, when you're thinking about um, how to sort of build this knowledge, is there, a, is there some thinking about networks uh, like a, across, you know, across contexts um, to, to build that kind of understanding of how, you know, strategies and, and institutional culture? Um, well, for us, um, we really, we were hoping to be able to do that. We had seven sites and we tried to create this social media network, as, you know, for them and they really didn't get into that too much. So, but fortunately we had a chunk of budget to bring them all together in South Africa to meet. And they, that was such a powerful experience for them for the reasons you say, exchanging their experiences, talking and so forth. And spontaneously after we left, they started a Facebook um, group themselves, which is still active uh, a, a couple of years later. So I think they're still telling us that those kinds of networks, face to face though, at least initially, um, can be really critically uh, useful for them. Yeah. Uh, so um, we at NDI, we work a lot on the processes and especially when it comes to enabling youth to offer policy alternatives and uh, is on specific issues that they care about. And of course here, the way it works, it works, let's say, one way is the cap increasing their capacity such as research skills, as I mentioned before, but also looking at the international best experiences in what they want to offer. We help them a lot in terms of, when it comes to research, also from the initial phases, such as 
when you identify the problem based on what, etc. Many often young people looking at the example of their of the politician, political leaders, come out immediately with policy solution without first going to a proper problem analysis and where those those issues are. When it comes to the network in this phase, also I would um, talk about the consultation. So while talking about issues and by offering policy solution, we at NDI we encourage a lot the young people to develop stakeholders, stakeholder analysis, stakeholder mapping, and in order to offer, to provide or to ask for consultations. This also means engagement. When we talk about consultation with other youth groups, with other young people at the local community, it's very important to engage them, to ask their opinion, and also to make sure that their opinion is, in, is an input in what they are offering next. So, I don't know if I answered your question. So, we, did you have a quick... Yes, I wanted to, to say you, that yeah. among the networks that I think we built in our project are the networks of the people who conducted the project. Mm -hmm. And this came in part uh, through a uh, kind of identity and emotion-raising experience. So I didn't realize how powerful it was going to be when I proposed it at the first meeting. All these people, many of them suspicious of the Americans who were there, mm -hmm. we wanted to come and tell them how they were going to construct their democracies. It didn't. <laughs> And uh, I asked them for their first remembered political experience. And we went around in a group and had that. And of course, the Americans and many of the Western Europeans talked about a school, you know, we had a uh, school council election and so on. The Europeans from the Eastern part, post-communist countries, talked about the picture of Lenin as a child that was on their wall. And they all said, I got chills when I thought about the picture of Lenin as a child that was on my wall. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, this, again, crediting the kinds of real life experiences that, that people have in these settings is a way of building lasting networks that, mm -hmm. that people will then uh, want to refer to and want to associate with and want to work for in their lives. Great. Well, thank you. Please join me in thanking our participants on this. <laughs>